Good morning and happy Sabbath, and welcome to worship with the Edmonds Adventist Church. Let's invite God to be with us as well. Lord God, our Creator, Redeemer, and Friend, today as rain gently refreshes the earth, may your Spirit refresh our souls through our worship. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm so glad that you've joined us today. We uh, have been worshiping this way for a long time now, and we are all hoping that it won't be too long before we're able to get back together, but I'll say more about that later. I want to start by looking at those members and uh, friends of the church that we want to keep in special prayer today. Um, we always do this. It's an important part of worship. Paul says that in being the body of Jesus Christ, we rejoice with those who rejoice and we weep with those who mourn. Today, uh, we especially think of the Rollins family, Mark and Asha, Isaac, and Adesh. Mark's father is dying. He lives over in Spokane. He's in the hospital now, but they are going to be sending him home on Monday, and they have decided not to continue any treatment or even nourishment, really. He will just have water, and uh, that means that the end will be coming soon. And you know, no matter how long our parents live, it isn't long enough. So please think about uh, Mark, and you will, might want to express your condolences to them. They're going to go over next weekend. They don't know whether he will uh, be able to make it that long or not. But we, our hearts go out to Mark at the impending loss of his father. We want to pray for a quick recovery for Danica Wright. 1.30 yesterday morning. Uh, she got up not doing well, and uh, Rick called the visiting nurse, and they said, get her to the hospital. And uh, about 9 o'clock yesterday morning, she had her gallbladder removed. She is now home, had a good night's sleep last night, and is doing better, still some pain. But we pray that Danica will recover quickly. And of course, it's especially hard when your spouse goes into the hospital now when you can't even go in. Rick uh, took her in the morning and then sat out in the parking lot until he knew what was going on and then went home. And, and when he went to pick her up, uh, he couldn't go in. Uh, the nurse wheeled her out to the car. Hard uh, to have things that way, but of course we understand why they have to be that way. We've been praying for a friend of Bonnie Parles. His name is Philip Jansma. He is a missionary in Peru. He and his wife have adopted a number of children, and he has had COVID, and unfortunately, yesterday, he passed away. So our hearts go out to his family and friends. Please pray for their comfort. An update for Taya Vargas, and we have some rejoicing to do here. Um, you know that she broke her ankle at Christmas time. She has been in a big, heavy cast, unable to put weight on it or walk on it. She's with Chuck and Patty and being well taken care of. But she did go to the doctor. They took the cast off and did x-rays and said that the foot is healing perfectly. So they are grateful for that. And instead of putting the big, heavy cast back on, she is able now to have a boot and a cushion, which is going to make sleeping a lot easier. Also want to pray for her with a job interview she has that she would really like. So please pray for her there. Mary Pease, she'll be telling our children's story later on. She's doing well. But remember, she has had uh, some minor heart issues and has been on a heart monitor. She sent that in, and now they've made an appointment in a week or two when they will go over it with her. So keep Mary in your prayers. Um, we also want to pray for Brynjir's uh, brother Snorri over in Iceland. 
Remember, we said that he was having problems with his blood pressure. They thought there was a problem with his lungs, but now they've decided it's not with his lungs, that the problem is with his kidneys, and he's starting to have kidney treatment. So pray for him. And he sent us a message thanking the congregation for our prayers for him. Talked with Muriel Martinez this week, and she's going to have to have another surgery in March. Her new job is going along well, but of course she would like to be over these health challenges, and we pray that that surgery will go well. Paulo Garcia has been under the weather, and uh, so we want to keep him in our prayers. I'll give you an update on my son and grandson. I mentioned before that they were both uh, suffering from COVID at, uh, at the present time. They live over in Spokane. Our grandson, Marcus, he's 17, and he is pretty well over it, at least he says. Um, Larry, on the other hand, is still struggling a bit. He's much better. The achiness has gone down, but he's still very tired and fatigued. And both of them have totally lost their sense of smell and taste for the time being. And uh, they say that you don't think much about the sense of smell till you don't have it. And you realize that it's more important than you thought it was. Then we have continuing prayers for others in our congregation and friends of our congregation. We want to pray for Paul and Bernice Brower, Jeannie Dalrymple, Joni and Ted Hunter, Mark Hilardis with his wrist. Carol Edholm, Jerry Babiak, Kathy Stewart for her son Tom and also for her cousin Jim Rathman, Dan Wells, Donovan's father, Gordy Short, Colleen McIntosh's son Romario, Paul Runnels, Danica Pease with the eyes uh, and the surgery. And we pray for those who are mourning uh, Marilyn Jordan, Dakota Jordan, Wendy Weaver. Sita Marshall, all who have had losses over the last few weeks. It's time for our offering. We can't pass the plate, but we do mention every week that there are at least two ways you can give. You can send a check to the church and we will get it. You can also go online on our website and it's very easy to give. And uh, we hope that you will remember your tithes and offerings, especially remember our church budget right now as well. We had a business meeting last Saturday night. It was a good group, about 30 who joined on Zoom. And we voted a new budget for this next year. Following a marvelous presentation on our church finances from our treasurer, Bernice Brower. Uh, I would say that uh, the presentation was a home run, but it actually was a grand slam home run. One of the best financial presentations I've ever seen, and I've seen a lot of them. So uh, thank you to Bernice for leading us through it and to our members who were there for passing our budget. And uh, I think we have a realistic budget as we move forward. Of course, there's always some uncertainty right now. We don't know how long it'll be before we're actually meeting in person. But uh, I, I think that it's a budget that has enough flexibility for whether we're uh, still online or whether we're in person. And I want to thank all of you. And again, especially Bernice for the marvelous presentation that she gave us. Very clear, easy to understand. I also want to thank our Pathfinders. It's so great to have our Pathfinders still very active. Last Sabbath afternoon, was the Pathfinder Bible Experience, kind of like College Bowl with uh, Bible questions. And our Pathfinders have been studying hard for that. And one of our groups, the group called God's Girls in our Pathfinder Club came in first place. And we'll move on to the next level of uh, PBE, which will be coming up soon. Also this week, our high school age Pathfinder teens, the leaders, will be having teen leadership training along with the Oregon Conference as well. Uh, it will be all on Zoom and we are grateful for the activity 
of our Pathfinder Club, and of course, especially to uh, Sophia Fullerton, who leads it. And we should say a word about what Governor Inslee did this week. He moved our county, Snohomish County, from phase one to phase two. However, phase two uh, guidelines for churches are really the same. They don't have a difference. Uh, it is still 25% of capacity, which would mean that if we did want to start meeting again, it would be about 90 people that we could have in our sanctuary, sitting separately in family pods, of course. And um, this Thursday night, our worship planning team, under the wonderful leadership of Troy Perry, will be meeting to think about uh, where we go in the future and how soon we start moving. So please pray for them and give pray that God will give them guidance. Uh, as I said last week, we may think about uh, something like a parking lot service sometime. Um, we're toying with the ideas. Snohomish County is improving a bit. Um, you know, back in September, our running total of cases per 100,000 over two weeks was down to just 42. And then things skyrocketed and went up to 448, I believe. Well, it's going down somewhat again. We're down to 253, which of course is better than 448, but it's still a long ways from 42. So they will have to struggle with all of that data and decide what is best. I want to thank those who are participating in our service today. Mary Pease will be giving our children's story. And then it's always wonderful to have our young people participating in the service. And it is Caitlin and Celine Ficke who will be offering our morning prayer. Then we will have some wonderful music from Dean Werner. At the end of the service, Sophia Fullerton will lead our hymn. And uh, she does double duty. She also gets us on to Facebook from Zoom each week. And of course, we thank Rick Wright, who is our producer and puts everything together so seamlessly. And Josh Daniel, who does all of our post-production and gets us on YouTube and our archived uh, website page so that you can go back and see things uh, later on if you miss it at the time. It's time now for our children's story. So kids, get as close to the screen as you can. And Mary has a very special story for you. Well, happy Sabbath, everybody. I hope you can see my friend here. This is a moose. It's Melvin the moose. Have you seen a moose before? So I want you to know a little bit about Melvin and his family. Can you say hi, Melvin? Hi, kids. How are you? I'm glad you are here. Mary's going to tell you about my family. So. Please listen. Okay, Melvin. Want you to can you kids see this? Can you see how big a moose is? A moose is bigger than a car. A moose is bigger than an elk or a deer. A moose is even bigger than a bison or a uh, buffalo, however you want to call them, and also much bigger than a deer. So I just thought by looking at this, you would be able to see how big that moose is. And with some more information about a moose is the size and the shape of a moose. A moose is taller than the biggest horse. An adult moose stands almost seven feet high at the shoulder. That's not even including these antlers. The moose is the largest member of a deer family. 
I didn't even know until I started studying that a moose was a member of the deer family. A male moose like Melvin with the antlers, a male moose is called a bull and weighs almost 2,000 pounds. I can't even imagine that. Females or the mother is called a cow and they weigh up to 1,080 pounds, but that still is a lot of weight. Baby moose are called calves and they are born in May or June of each year. And only, like I said, only the male, like Melvin, has antlers. A female moose, which we know now as a cow, usually has either one baby or twins. And that is if there's a lot of food available. After nine months or a year, a calf is old enough now to leave its mother and go out on its own. The colors of a moose are dark brown, like this, reddish brown, or even grayish brown. A moose really prefers cold weather. When it is hot, they cool off in lakes or any water that is like streams that are in the forest. Pardon me, I get my notes because I can't remember all of it. Moose find their food in water often diving to 18 feet underwater to reach plants. I didn't know about that. They eat all year round. They eat the shoots from trees, you know, those new stems that are coming out from the trees. They eat leaves, they eat stems, they eat twigs. They even eat the bark off of small shrubs. And about, to, they eat up to about 70, pounds every day. I can't even imagine eating that much food. Moose have been just known to swim up to 12 miles. And guess what? A moose can run up to 35 miles an hour. That is amazing. You know, when you get in your car and you go out in the neighborhood, usually, you know, you, you know that looks fast and even faster when you get on the freeway, but normally when you're in your neighborhood, a moose can run, <laughs> your car, excuse me, your car will go maybe 25 miles an hour or maybe 30, but normally not up to 35 because and until you go on the freeway, then you really get up high. But can you imagine Moose, if it was running down the road in your neighborhood, would be running faster than your car. That is totally amazing. Here's the silhouette of a moose. Can you see that when the sunshine, it's sunrise or sunset is behind him? Moose have long legs, can powerfully move themselves over dead trees, over rocks and hills, and into deep snow. If frightened, a moose can charge and make noise by moving bushes that get in its way. But when a moose is calm and at peace, it can move almost silently like a cat. You know, when a cat moves, you don't hear anything. You do when a dog moves, but not when a cat moves. And they don't live in herds. They don't have a whole bunch of moose around. They are solitary animals, which mean they go by themselves, and they do not live in herds. One thing before a moose gets ready to go to bed at night, it will move upwind. From wherever the wind is going, it's going to go up there. And then it'll swing back. So if any animal like a wolf or a bear is trying to find a moose, this will keep it out of the reach of, and they won't be able to tell where the sleeping moose is because now the moose is downwind. This allows the moose to smell and hear such animals as wolves and bears because they don't want to get caught by them. That's not good news. So believe it or not, you know, 
A moose is not to be your pet. You don't want to invite it in. It stays in the woods. And I think I've only seen a moose maybe twice. Once in Alaska, and the other time I saw a moose at Northwest Trek in Eatonville, Washington. But that was when I was on a truck going out in the area. So I just wanted you to know how exciting it is to find about this wonderful animal that God has made for us. Made and how this animal, even though it doesn't speak, it knows how to survive in the wild. I hope you enjoyed this story, no matter what your age. I learned a lot, and I hope you did too. Take care. God bless you. Good morning, church family. I hope you are having a wonderful Sabbath. Please bow your heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful day you have given us. God, please be with all the frontliners, and please be with all the COVID-19 patients, and uh, please be with all the prayer requests that Pastor John has said, and please be with him as he speaks within you. And God, thank you for um, sacrificing for us. Thank you for everything you have done for us. It means a lot to us, and uh, thank you for everything, Lord, in your name, amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath, Sabbath everyone. Thank you, Dean, and thank you, Caitlin and Celine, and thank you, Mary. You know, it's amazing how worked up and emotional people can get over very small matters. For example, I read about a man named John Richards in Boston, England. He got all worked up over the fact that people do not correctly use the apostrophe. He's a retired copy editor, 75 years old, and it just bugged him that he would go around the neighborhood and there would be signs where people didn't use proper grammar with the apostrophe. For instance, there was a store that said, Ladies Fashions, and ladies was spelled L-A-D-I-E-S, which is the plural. It should have been the possessive, L-A-D-Y apostrophe S. Well, he found this all around the place, and he finally decided he needed to do something about it. So he formed an organization called the Apostrophe Protection Society. He and his son went around to all of these businesses who improperly used the apostrophe, and they left them a note. <clears throat> Here is what the note said. 
Dear sir or madam, because there seems to be some doubt about the use of the apostrophe, we are taking the liberty of drawing your attention to an incorrect use. And then they would spell out the incorrect use. Going on, we would like to emphasize that we do not intend any criticism, but are just reminding you of the correct usage should you wish to put right this mistake. Well, there was an article in the paper about his apostrophe protection society. And afterwards, 50 people wrote in and said they wanted to sign up. In fact, he was so successful, he said he might start working on other grammar problems. He said the incorrect use of fewer and less is another thing that really annoys me. If I carry on, I can get quite worked up. Well, if people can get worked up and emotional over such a little thing as an apostrophe, think how much people can get worked up over bigger matters like politics. We've seen a lot of polarization there, haven't we? And maybe even more so when religious matters are at stake. Now, you remember at the very beginning of the book of Acts, we read that the church was of one accord. They were all together. They were praying together every day. They had pooled their resources together. They were all of one accord. But you know, it didn't last. By the time we get to the middle of the book of Acts, there are disputes. I had a New Testament professor once in graduate school who said, you know, we're always saying we need to be more like the early Christians. We need to be more like the early Christians. He said, when I read the New Testament, it seems to me that we're a lot like them already. For you see, after Paul and Barnabas returned from their first missionary journey that we've been traveling along, going with them, they went back to Antioch where they started and a big dispute broke out in Acts chapter 15. Today, we're going to look at three things about this dispute. We are going to look at what the issue was. Then we're going to look at the process they used to discuss the issue. And then we're going to look at what principles guided them in solving this dispute. Now, let's remember where we were last week. In just a very few verses, Luke in Acts summarizes, this is the end of chapter 14, um, the last part of their journey. Here's a map that will show you where they were last week. Remember, we saw them in Lystra, and then they went on to Derby, And then they went back and they retraced where they had been and ended up going back down to the Mediterranean Sea, and then a long sailing trip back to Antioch in Syria, where they had started out. Well, they got back there, and when they talked to the people in Antioch, they told them all the wonderful things that God had done while they were out on their missionary trip. They told them about the Gentiles who had come to know God. And many of the people were excited. But not all. And that brings us to the issue. <coughs> what was the issue? What was the problem? Well, we read about it starting in Acts 14.27. Through 15, 2. On arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. And they stayed there a long time with the disciples. Some men came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. 
This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So no longer is everyone of one accord. There is a sharp dispute. In fact, this word is a very strong word that Luke uses to talk about this dispute. It's a word that's often used for insurrection or riot. It's the word used in the Gospels when it says that Barabbas had led an insurrection. It's the word that will be used later in the book of Acts in chapter 19 when the people of Ephesus had a riot in the theater. And so there is a very sharp dispute that breaks out. And the issue is circumcision. They are inviting Gentiles to become part of God's people without circumcision. Now, according to these people who came from Judea, this was clearly unbiblical. All they had to do was read the Bible, and they should have known better. Genesis chapter 17, verses 12 to 14. <coughs> Genesis says, For the generations to come, every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised, including those born in your household or bought from, with money from a foreigner. My covenant in your flesh is to be an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who has not been circumcised in the flesh will be cut off from his people he has broken my covenant. So you can see where they said, listen, Genesis says that this is to be an everlasting thing. And anybody who isn't is to be cut off from the people. So how can you bring people into the people of God without them being circumcised? Now, circumcision is not an issue for us. We do have issues, however. I think of women's ordination, how we relate to standards, the church and race relations, homosexuality, and we could go on and on. So maybe even though circumcision isn't an issue for us, this chapter is not irrelevant. Perhaps it can give us guidance as we think about how we face problems that might come up in the church today. How would Christians relate when they differ? And so we're going to look at what they did. So the first thing, the issue, circumcision. Let's move to the second. What was the process that they used? How did they go about solving this problem? Well, let's look at several steps. First of all, they decided to get together and talk. They would talk about the issue. And they went to a lot of trouble to be able to do that. The people of Antioch sent Paul and Barnabas all the way from Antioch down to Jerusalem to have these conversations. And in Acts 15, 6, it says they met together to consider the question and had much discussion. So first of all, they had much discussion. They talked together about the issue. Generally, nothing gets solved until we start talking. Second, all the different voices were heard. The believers who were against letting Gentiles in when they were uncircumcised. It's, Acts uh, tells us that many of them had been Pharisees before they became Christians. They were concerned about what was happening. Their voice was heard. And then Peter spoke up. And Peter had his own personal story of how the Holy Spirit had worked in his life. How he would have agreed with those Pharisees who had become Christians at one time. But then he had that amazing vision up on the roof. And he was told to eat these unclean animals and said, I've never eaten anything like that. But then God told him, the dream is really about people. 
you're no longer to consider any people unclean. And then there was the knock on the door and these people came from Cornelius and then he went and did something he would never have done before he entered into a Gentile's home. And then he told how the Holy Spirit was poured out on those Gentiles. And he said, how can we keep them from baptism when they have received the Holy Spirit just as we did? And then Paul and Barnabas told the stories of what had happened as they went around and saw these Gentiles come to know God. And then James, the leader of the church, the Lord's own brother, got up. And it's interesting, he refers back to Peter. But there's something really interesting that's very subtle, but I think Luke wants us to catch it. Peter, of course, was Peter's nickname given by Jesus. His name was Simon. Simon is the Greek spelling of that name. There is a Hebrew spelling as well, Simeon. Same name, just uh, the spelling in two different languages. Well, all through the New Testament, Peter is always called Simon. However, this one time, this one time, James calls him Simeon, Peter. Now, why would he do that? Well, I think Luke wants us to remember that way back at the beginning of Luke's gospel, when Jesus was taken to the temple, Simeon, the old prophet, had said that Jesus would be a light of revelation to the Gentiles. And you remember that when he was back in Iconium, when we saw just a couple of weeks ago, Paul quoted from Isaiah the same passage that Simeon had quoted there in the temple when Jesus was being dedicated. So with this subtle reference, James is saying, see, that promise made by the old patriarch in the temple is being fulfilled. And then he quotes from Amos in the Old Testament, where there's a vision of how God will rebuild the nation by bringing in the Gentiles. And so they came to a decision. They came to a decision that Gentiles should be allowed to become part of the people of God without becoming Jews first and being circumcised. However, they also had some compromise elements here. They did ask those Gentiles to refrain from things that were specifically abhorrent to Jews. Fornication, which of course Paul talks about a lot anyway, sexual immorality. Eating things that were strangled, drinking blood, or going and participating in idolatry by eating food offered to idols. These were things that the Old Testament had said even Gentiles who came and lived among the Jews should do. And so they said, yes, Gentiles can come in, but they don't have to be circumcised. They do need to be sensitive, however. And at the same time, they didn't demand that the Jews stop circumcising. They allowed for diversity. So here they came to a decision that tried to represent all voices and follow what they believed God was leading. Finally, number four, they clearly communicated this. They wrote a letter. It's a great letter. We don't have time to read it, but if you read it in Acts 15, it's a very good example of what letters looked like in the first century world. And it communicates the results clearly so that people are aware. So let's review this. We have a slide that we will review the process. First of all, they had open discussion. Then they let all voices be heard. Then they came to a consensus and a decision. Didn't make everybody happy, but it did try to hear all voices. And then they clearly communicated the decision. A process that I think we could emulate today. 
Well, let's move on though. What were the principles that guided this process? And I see several things here. Number one, they were faithful to scripture, but they looked at the broad vision of scripture, not just an individual passage. They weren't looking for proof texting to say, here's the passage that proves it for us. They weren't looking at scripture in just a literal specific way, but they looked for that broad vision of scripture, which said God wants to bring in the Gentiles. Second, and that leads us to the second, they had a principle of inclusion rather than exclusion. They said God wants to embrace people. God is a God of love. He wants to reach out and bring people in. His goal is not to keep people out, to be exclusive, but to bring people in. And so let's try to make it easy. Both Peter and James say we don't want to make it hard for people. We don't want to set up barriers for people. We want to embrace people and let them see God's love and grace. Number three, they looked for the leading of the Spirit in the lives and the stories of the people of God. How was the Spirit working? Well, they heard Peter's story. It was important to hear the stories, not just to talk about theoretical issues, but to listen to the stories of people. Peter's story of what had happened there with Cornelius. Paul and Barnabas' stories of what had happened out as they went on their missionary journey through Asia Minor. Stories are important. It's kind of the way we really process life. You can always tell when the preacher tells a story, people listen more carefully. And I think in issues like this, we need to listen to stories. I, I've been involved in several occasions in the issue of uh, the ordination of women in the church. I was on that task force and I was a delegate to the Pacific Union Conference constituency meeting back in 2012 that voted to ordain women in the Pacific Union. And uh, I even made a speech there, and I voted in favor of women's ordination, and it, it passed by 80%. One of the most convincing things was the stories, the stories of what women were doing. I worked with five different associate pastors when I was pastoring in California, five different women associates. And they all were such a blessing to the congregation. And so stories need to be told. Finally, even at the end, they did not all agree. But they allowed for some diversity. Yes, they had to make some specific decisions. Yes, Gentiles could come in without being circumcised. But there would be sensitivity and there would be an allowance for diversity. Not everyone was forced to accept this in terms of stopping circumcision. Those who, in a Jewish context, wanted to continue with circumcision could do it. And we will find later in the book of Acts that for the sake of missionary uh, work, Paul even would circumcise one who was half Jew and half Gentile. So why didn't they all come together? Why didn't they all agree on everything? Why did they have to allow for some diversity? Well, you know, we're never all going to see everything the same way. But let's look at those principles. Here's another slide that will look at these principles that we see. First of all, they were guided by scripture, but they were guided not by just individual proof texts. They were guided by a broad picture of what the vision of scripture was. Second, they were guided by the principle of inclusion, trying to make God's grace 
accessible to people, not trying to put up barriers to keep them out. Third, they looked for the way the Spirit was working by seeing the stories of the people who were working for God. And finally, they allowed for diversity. They didn't make everybody do exactly the same thing. And yet they had some clear lines. So I was asking the question, why allow for diversity? Why didn't everybody just come to see it all the same way? <laughs> if the argument was compelling, why wasn't everyone convinced of everything? Well, you know, we come from different backgrounds. We have different experiences. Our culture conditions us in different ways. And so we simply will always see some things differently. There will always be areas where we aren't all 100%. There are some things that we must be 100%. Basic, basic doctrines. But you know, there are so many things where we are not all seeing everything the same way because we come from different backgrounds, because we have different ideas, different pasts, different experiences. And I think that really becomes clear when we are in a different culture, when we are all of a sudden with people who didn't have the same background that we did. I think of an experience that happened a long time ago. It was back in 1984. At Loma Linda University Medical Center, there was a very famous case. The famous surgeon Leonard Bailey, who died a couple of years ago now, transplanted the heart of a baboon into baby Fay. It was the first successful heart transplant that worked from uh, another species into a human. And she lived for 21 days, which was amazing. And that research led the way to infant heart transplants that would save hundreds of kids eventually in the work that they did there at Loma Linda. But at the time, there were people who were strong animal rights activists who protested. Out in front of Loma Linda University Medical Center, there were people with placards protesting the sacrifice of this baboon for the heart for baby Faye. In fact, there were death threats against Leonard Bailey. There was at one point where they were even thinking of having him wear a bulletproof vest because people were so angry, the animal rights activists. Now, it wasn't the majority of Americans, but certainly a, a group that was very uh, vociferous. Animal rights activists uh, protesting this baboon heart being placed in a baby because of the sacrificing of the baboon. Now, I was in South Africa at the time doing a short-term mission teaching assignment for Andrews University. And you should have heard the people in South Africa reacting to these animal rights activists. They thought that was the craziest thing they had ever heard in their lives. There were articles in the paper mocking Americans because of these animal rights activists. And of course, they were very interested in South Africa because Christian Bernard, uh, some decade and a half earlier, had been the first to do a human heart transplant. And so the whole issue was a big one in South Africa. And it was in all the papers. It was on the front pages. <laughs> and as I say, they mocked and made fun of Americans because there could be animal rights activists who were protesting the life of this baboon. Now, why would they feel that way? Because in South Africa, baboons, at least at that time, were simply pests. They thought of baboons about the same way that we think of rats. 
I remember being out with uh, a couple of my students one day and we hit a traffic jam and they wondered if there had been an accident or what had happened. Well, this next picture will show you what happened. There was just a whole bunch of baboons in the road and they were climbing over all the cars and stopped traffic. Baboons, there are pests. They get rid of them. In fact, they told me that on the campus there where we were in South Africa, the Adventist campus, a couple times a year, they would just go out and shoot baboons. Otherwise, they would take over the campus. And so they would just go out and shoot baboons and put them in a big pile and burn them. So you can see if you live in that kind of a culture, how you would have a very hard time understanding the animal rights activists in America and vice versa. Just a simple little example of the fact that our backgrounds, our culture, our experience do lead us to different ideas. But it seems to me that the kind of process and the kind of principles that we see here in Acts 15 can help us as Christians. It doesn't mean that every problem will be solved. It doesn't mean that we will all agree on everything. But I think it does give us a way forward when there are conflicts in the church. Wouldn't it be wonderful if in this polarized world, people would look at the church and say, you know, there are people who know how to solve conflict well. There are people who can be an example to the world of what to do when people disagree. And I believe that is possible. Of course, it's only possible if we make Jesus Christ the center of what we do and make him the foundation of our community. Let's sing together. The church has one foundation. It is Jesus Christ, her Lord.
Let's pray. Our loving Lord, we pray that you will truly be the foundation of all that we do. And as a result, we pray that there will be unity and that we will be able to look forward to that glorious morn when the church will be at rest with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Join us during the week, 7.30 each weeknight, although there'll be two exceptions this week. Monday night and Thursday night, I have other committees, so Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday night will be there at 7.30, the same spot on our Facebook page with our church family update. And of course, we hope you'll join us again next week as well. Thank you so much for being with us. God bless.